are very well built. They're very similar in design, architectural design, to both the Cray and the uh, Cyber 205. <laughs> They've taken a lot of the ideas generated here, but they are later models. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, some of the students, uh, some of the people at Fujitsu, for example, who built the machine or worked on it, were students at the University of Illinois and some of the other uh, universities in this country, took back with them some of the ideas of the software technology to make supercomputers better and have implemented them, whereas we have not. Some of the programs running on the Fujitsu and Hitachi machines actually run faster there than they do here. Uh, some of the um, measurements that are used often are called the Livermore, the 14 Livermore kernels. <coughs> and if you uh, test them on the Japanese machines, you find that they're probably twice as fast as anything we can do here. Uh, see, I just spent uh, two weeks in Japan about uh, about a month ago, and uh, I came away very much impressed by their supercomputer ac activities. I did see both of the existing machines that that uh, Sid just mentioned in operation. I also saw one of the machines that had just been, the Hitachi machine had just been uh, uh, installed on the uh, Tokyo University campus, and it was, they were just bringing that one up into operation. But I, I think those machines, although possibly better than faster, uh, better in, in some uh, performance criteria to the existing Class 6 machines in the United States, that's really not the issue. The issue is the work that's being done on a 10 gigaflop machine uh, in which they have had about two years of um, um, head start, I would guess, on ETA and the other folks who are working in this country. And that machine is very impressive in its architecture. Uh, the folks at Mitsubishi, where the architecture for that machine was largely conceived, and I might point out that the head of the research group there at Mitsubishi was a student on the Illinois campus uh, at the time the ARPA ILIAC IV was created. And his uh, uh, leadership of that, of that organization obviously has strongly influenced the design of the advanced supercomputer. And the architectural structure of that machine is, uh, I think, certainly uh, stands well to to have it be a, a competitive with with any of the machines that uh, are now envisioned uh, in this country, either by Cray Research or by uh, ETA CDC. And let me add one comment. Uh, people have emphasized that the Japanese are putting their prototype models of supercomputers into universities. One of the critical signals that the U.S. needs to give to the U.S. computer industry, to the users of computing, is that we're going to do likewise. And the right way to start is at the University of Illinois, which has been me mentioned repeatedly here. Question over there? Well, yeah, I have a question. Uh, I detect maybe there's some, maybe some conflict among some of the panel members between uh, priorities, say, between the uh, fifth generation proje uh, project at DARPA and uh, the Dr. Wilson's emphasis on, uh, on uh, creating a, a user uh, community of uh, supercomputers. Could anybody comment on that? Uh, what I see, I mean, computers are becoming ubiquitous in our life and <clears throat> what I feel is that the effort that I'm talking about and the effort that Dr. Cooper is talking about are both extremely important. Uh, you know, since I've defended my point of view, let me defend Dr. Cooper's point of view. I think, I think that it's an extremely risky project that he's talking about and my comments reflect that. On the other hand, I think it is so important that we be, that our non-nuclear weapons before, become more capable than they are now, that I would have a very difficult time of it if a congressman asked me, should we spend our money on Dr. Cooper's project or your project? 
Of course, ma'am. I think we should spend it on both. Yes, ma'am, we can comment on that. I think we ought to spend it on both also. One of the things that bothers me a great deal, as I mentioned before, was the software for supercomputers. As a matter of fact, software for all computers. And I believe without artificial intelligence activities, without expert systems, we may not be able to do much in the software world in the future. We must have that capability. Yes, over here on the side. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to go back to the subject of the Japanese challenge for a second and ask uh, Dr. Cooper um, whether we really are in danger of getting in, uh, whether U.S. defense systems are in danger of uh, getting in trouble by relying on Japanese technology, or, or do you think that we've got our own technology coming on stream fast enough? Well, I think the argument has been given that uh, without a strong computer industry in the United States that we might find ourselves in the 1990s uh, with no other source of the most advanced computers than, uh, than the Japanese. And uh, I personally don't believe that's, that's the case. After viewing what the Japanese are doing in great detail, we visited a wide variety of uh, government laboratories sponsored by MIDI, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, uh, Japanese uh, uh, computer science research on campuses and all of the major uh, companies that are involved in computer activities uh, in Japan, I feel that our industry is highly competitive, that the Japanese have a, have a serious problem on their hands trying to address any markets in the United States, and I don't believe that, that uh, even if ARPA's program were not to go forward, that defense would be in serious trouble in the 1990s. But I think that with ARPA's program, we're virtually guaranteed a strong uh, industry that defense can rely on for its peculiar needs in the 1990s. Now, key to that whole issue is IBM. IBM dominates the computer market in the United States. And their vision or their view of what's important for IBM, not for the country, is what determines what they pursue and what they market. And in the past um, uh, 10 years or so, they've abandoned the supercomputer market entirely. They, they didn't believe that the investments that they would make there, have to make there, in order to make machines that were competitive, would pay off for them. Now, that's my, my view of what they've actually done. Others may have other views of that. Um, there are views that they have uh, considered getting back into that business as uh, their vision of what Ken Wilson was talking about may be changing. But at least in that particular area, they were not meeting defense's need, if defense's need is, is defined as the needs of our nuclear weapon designers and the needs of our uh, cryptanalysis uh, capabilities at, uh, at the uh, National Security Agency. And so, uh, what we expect will happen is that, that as ARPA stimulates the industry's research efforts and the campus research efforts in machine intelligence, uh, either IBM will decide that that is a good thing to do research in and to be competitive in and, and, and have a, a capability there that will be available to defense in the 1990s, or it won't. And if it doesn't, there will be many others who will uh, participate in those research programs and will spin off uh, both defense and commercial applications of that technology. So we're buying an insurance policy uh, against uh, IBM's management not viewing that, that machine intelligence is a thing that they want to pursue or is, will be beneficial for, for IBM's purposes in, the, in that time period. And I, I think that we're going to have a very strong industry and that machine intelligence is going to play a very, very important role in that industry in the 1990s. And if the IBM senior management doesn't see that, then uh, if my view is right, uh, uh, their share of the market, which has gone from 90% to 80% to 70% to now less than 60% of the world market, will go to 50%, 40%, 30%, 20% of the world market, in my view. And, uh, and it, it remains to be seen, I guess, as the 1990s come upon us, who's, who's right about that? But IBM is key to, to the industry in this, in this country. Yes, sir. Dr. Clark, you 
Martin back. I, I think that's for this question. The software problem is one that, that we faced with mini computers, with microcomputers, with uh, eight inch stars. And we've had many initiatives to try and get software that'll do the job. Um, and, and we have a whole new problem with the supercomputer area because it's, it's not distributed over a large base of machines to amortize. Are there, uh, are there solutions that you can, you can see that can help to solve the software problem? Well, I believe that the supercomputer will present extra difficult problems simply because of their immense size and uh, requirements for operating systems. And I feel that the sooner we get started using expert systems to help in the design of the software and the implementation of the software, the better off will be. That's the only solution I see in the future. Ken? I would like to take up that same question. Uh, <clears throat> it became clear, especially from my industrial visits over the past few years, that the software problem is the key. The, the reason the market is not developing today so rapidly that we don't even worry about the Japanese is the software bottleneck. I mean, if it weren't for the software bottleneck, supercomputers would be by the thousands in industry today. Uh, and when I visited industry, what they complained to me was not that they weren't getting powerful enough of computers, but they were having trouble with the software for the computers they already had. So I've started looking into it myself in collaboration with the computer science department at Cornell, which is in the general area of languages, one of the strongest departments in the country. And I've started to understand some of the problems, which includes the problem that what has already been learned about how to do better software has not penetrated the scientific and engineering computing area to any great extent. That is, technically speaking, the language of scientific engineering, compu engineering computing is a language called Fortran, which does not deserve the title of being called a language. But what I have learned from our project, uh, which by the way, as far as I know, is essentially the only project where real working scientists writing scientific programs are being consulted about what the uh, software problem is. We, I mean, we actually have computer scientists in direct dialogue with scientists about how they write their programs. Uh, what I found is in the scientific engineering community, there's a very deep need to be able to talk about their programs, to be able to write their programs in the natural language of science in the language of mathematics, technical terminology for each discipline, and English or a foreign language if necessary. And the rejection of modern software concepts by the scientific and engineering community is, I believe, due to the fact that those concepts have not been stated in the natural language of scientists and engineers. And the, when I've talked about what we call the Gibbs Project, which is our joint effort with computer science, to working programmers in industry and scientists. I mean, they get very excited and very enthusiastic, and that's what they really want to discuss with me, is that idea of how to attack the software problem by using the natural language of scientists, and not by going to a third language, a language invented by computer scientists who invented the language with no reference to the way scientists like to express themselves. Yes. Just one uh, question of clarification from Dr. Wilson. Uh, the, the signal that you mentioned earlier in your talk, uh, you later had a couple of, couple of references. I'm not quite sure what you meant. Was it the budget or was it the funding at the university and the installation of a supercomputer there at the University of Illinois? Okay. The, what I, what I, the, the signal that I'm talking about is a signal to the universities, to the computing industry, and to a lesser extent, but still important, to the industrial users of computing, that this country is going to go forward, that they can all, all those three groups can start taking risks, which will be backed up by the country as a whole, in terms of designing computers, in terms of building programs in universities that will require these computers, in terms of developing the research in industry that will need these computers, 
And the signal that I'm talking about, a signal that the country is going to back this up, would be an action by Congress to raise the $20 million that is presently proposed in the President's budget for 85 to a larger amount, despite the deficit, despite all the economic difficulties we're in. If, if the Congress were to say, this is so important that we have to raise that figure from $20 million to whatever it is agreed upon should be a reasonable figure. That, I think, is the signal that everybody is waiting for. And especially, the reason that's important is because it feeds into the training of scientists and engineers who are going to use the next generation of supercomputers. If we don't do that training of people, then there'll be no point in industry buying those computers if they haven't got to train people to use them. So it is that signal of raising that budget and recognizing that the, that the country is going to have to take the responsibility for that training program that everybody needs. That I believe, based on my discussions, all the discussions I've taken place over the past few years, I think it is that signal that will release this activity. And the total activity will be incredibly larger than that amount that Congress votes. I mean, the leverage on that figure is just incredible. Dr. Yes, ma'am. Could you put a dollar figure on that and give us some range of what you're talking about? What would be a reasonable figure? Okay, it is my belief. I mean, what we would like to get is $100 million, but it is my belief that a vote of $50 million would, that is probably the minimum figure that would get this process started. <laughs> 